What up guys? We're starting a brand new project, building a cool drift cart, starting with this. All right, diving into the hard drives on this one. I wasn't expecting to make a full video on this one simply because it didn't actually finish the way we wanted it to. But this project is from back at the tail end of COVID. We were bored, stuck in the house, and someone gave us this free crusty old four-wheeler. So we decided to chuck a new battery, carburetor, and a new wiring harness into it, see if we could get it running and driving, and then decided to chop it up and turn it into a drip car. All right, so now that it's running, we have the new carb on, new wiring harness and everything. It's running really good. We've been able to actually drive it down the street, which is pretty cool. <laughs> it's just, uh, obviously there's no place to sit down. Uh, and it's got lots of power, which is sweet. Uh, I did some research on this motor. It turns out it's actually a 200cc engine. Uh, it's called a life fan. Some kind of, uh, it's from Taiwan, I think. But pretty cool, it's got plenty of power. Uh, but anyway, the uh, plan here is to start just tearing everything apart. Let's get it stripped down to the bare frame. Uh, I want to figure out if we can find a way to put the motor on the swing arm. I don't know. We'll see. I got to kind of figure out how this is going to go. Because I don't want it to be too long and narrow because it'll just look funky. So just kind of have to visualize it. So let's get it torn down and maybe start cutting the frame up and see what it looks like. That was just about the easiest thing ever. Um, probably fastest motor sock or motor pull I've ever done. <laughs> Cause uh, I was able to just lift it out of the frame and it's already starting to look like a go-kart. This is perfect. Just kind of have to figure out where things are going to go and where we're going to sit and how much we're going to have to stretch this frame. So I think the next thing I want to do is take the shocks off. Cause I want to get this thing down lower to the ground. So it is more like a go-kart. And then we're going to have to figure out, start mocking up where the motor's going to sit and uh, see if we can salvage any of these motor mounts for the back and kind of go from there. Awesome. There. Need to be strategic about this. You know, just end up on the files. Yeah. Chopped up metal. Because I want to do this in a way where, like, I feel like this is definitely going to have to be where the seat, where you sit. Yeah. Because this is the wide part. Yep. This is where we can attach controls and things. Now, if I want to lengthen this, if I cut it, say. If I cut it like here and here, and then I cut it like here, here, and here, I can just get two that extend all of this, and then like the foot pegs become part of the base frame. Then I can just get DOM and shove them on the OD of it and s stretch the whole thing so that the, this becomes like a whole base basically stretched out. Um, and then we're going to have to, obviously, because this has got to come out because we have to sit here. So we're going to have to have some bars that come out and around the driver. 
and then link back up to this and then this is going to need to be higher so that we can fit the engine back here so i'm going to chop the back end of this right here and here so we can sleeve it and bring it up and then make a bracket for our shock uh, and kind of go from there Yeah. I think the first thing we need to do is get the motor mounted because the motor is going to kind of dictate where the seat's going to go and how long we need to stretch the frame because um, obviously we want significant amount of room between the header and the seat because <laughs> we don't want to catch it on fire which I'm thinking we might have to take one of these old road signs and make a heat shield out of it so that we don't catch the seat on fire. Uh, that's for later. Um, so yeah, so I think what I'm going to do is kind of mock the motor up over the swing arm and then make sure that we can still clear the rear brake caliper um, and kind of start dreaming up uh, how we're going to do the mounting. I think... Donnie's got a bunch of angle iron left over from his build in his van, so we should have plenty of steel to kind of make that happen. And the angle iron is what eighth? What? Yeah, it's 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 uh, two by two by eight thick, which is still way thicker than what the old bracket was made out of. So we're probably going to be way overkill with it, but you know, overkill's better anyway. So, so this is the sleeve out of the engine for one of the motor mounts it's the sleeve that goes in the motor mount and as you can see the stud that held it or the bolt that held it we had to cut off because it's like rusted in there so i'm going to try and break it free if uh if i can't bring it free on the press probably gonna have to just chuck this up in the lathe and try and drill it out but we kind of need the sleeve and i'm lazy and i don't really want to i don't really want to remake it so i'm gonna try pressing it Oof. <laughs> and I guess we're drilling it. So this is our power plant for this bad boy. It used to use this mount here, which we just got the bolts be bolt out of. Uh, and it had this four bolt pattern here. But I don't want to use that anymore. They have this extra mounting location like here and here that wasn't actually used at all on the quad. Um, which I want to use this for that, I think. And then I might use this for like the shock mount so that the motor's kind of tied into the whole structure of the thing. Uh, but we'll see. So I'm thinking these holes up here might be perfect for that back 
mount on that motor, but that's one of the holes for the brake caliper. But what I'm thinking here is I can make a new bracket and weld it to this flange. That maybe moves, instead of the brake caliper being here, it kind of moves it down here. Should make it nicer to kind of keep it out of the way anyway. I want to get this hole, and this, the, you know, the rotor's on a slip spline, so it really doesn't matter where it lands. It can kind of land wherever it needs to. So if I space this out, the thickness of whatever steel I'm using, and then just kind of weld it to the face of this, should be all right. off a little bit. Oh, for the sprockets to line up? Yeah. I wonder if I can turn some material off the back of that hub and bring it in. And I need to grind a relief in the case right here. Check this out. Boom. I think that's about it, bud. <laughs> yeah. You all facing? It's the wrong chain. I thought this was a five. A four. This is a four twenty chain. I could have sworn this was uh, the right chain. Oh, it's the wrong width. That's the problem. Well. Maybe we can test fit it with this one. Rusty ass chain. Sweet. nice with the brackets all chamfered and stuff it actually looks like somewhat intentional <laughs> Motor mounts are all sorted out, fully welded, everything's bolted in. Uh, I gotta get a different chain because it turns out the chain that I bought was actually the wrong size. So I'll get one of those ordered. Uh, axles back together, got our chain gears lined up with our new spacers. I think that's it so far for mounting the motor to the swing arm. Later we're going to have to kind of figure out how we're going to do the shock mount. So I may have a couple ideas for that. And I think now we can go about stretching the frame and start kind of sorting out how long we need the frame to be and where we want to mount the seat. So moving along. So 
I got the frame all leveled um, to where the existing tubes were cut. Today we're working on stretching the frame, figuring out the seat location, and getting some sleeves cut, and maybe start even tacking some stuff together. Um, but first things first, we gotta set the seat on there, make sure we got proper clearance for everything, and then figure out how far we want to go with this to get um, sort of a comfortable foot position. The outside. Well, the pedals are like here and here. Yeah, that's, that's, that's perfectly, perfectly fine. Yeah. It's doable. That's more more room than I had in my actual book. Sweet. When I was a wee one. So we got some raw stock here. Uh, I got some DOM, which stands for Drawn Over Mandrel Tubing. And the uh, advantage to having DOM over, say, your standard seam welded pipe is that there isn't a seam weld in the middle. It's a lot stronger, for one, uh, which, again, probably overkill for this project. Uh, and two, it's easy to sleeve. You can slip stuff inside the ID because the ID of the tube is a lot more consistent, not having a seam weld there. So I got 20 feet of that. Got a whole stick. Uh, and then... <laughs> I got a couple feet of just uh, solid bar stock, 1018 bar stock, so we can make ourselves some sleeve plug junctions to slip into the ID of the tubes that we're connecting together and extending. It'll make our connection point a lot stronger so that the lap shear of the steel is not reliant on the weld, which I don't want to be relying on my welds anyway because they're not that great. Um, and we're more or less relying on the thickness of the the part that's slipping into the ID of the tube to make it strong, give us a nice strong connection. So, uh, oh yeah, this is one inch OD 095 wall, which I just matched the wall thickness of the tubing that's on it currently. Uh, the sizes are a little weird because this quad's made in China, so it's all um, metric sizes, but uh, we'll make it work. All right, so I'm gonna cut a bunch of chunks off of this bar stock so that I don't have to part it off. And then I'm gonna chuck them up in the lathe and turn down the diameters so that they'll each slip into every end of the tube that we wanna sleeve together. D is gonna cut the DOM, four of them at 30 inches. And then uh, we gotta prep all the tube and uh, start tapping stuff together. So I think we're pretty damn close there. All right, so my plan here is to kind of use this like this is like a shock tower. It needs to be up here. So obviously we need to make some extension tubes. These guys are going to get cut off. And then my plan is to sort of tie, you know, it's going to be about yay. And then I'm going to tie this guy into our frame rails here in diagonal somewhere, maybe as far up as I can go. And then I'm going to tie these somewhere into those frame rails so that we can still climb over and get in. 
but everything's kind of triangulated between the front and the back. You know, we'll still have a little bit of twist this way. It's not going to be super strong, but, you know, we're not building a, not building an off-road car here. I'm trying to keep it simple. And then, uh, plan is we have a bunch of this leftover angle iron. I also want to reinforce the frame this way. Not really sure how I'm going to do that yet. We'll figure it out. basically going through these points here right and I could see this rail flexing like the two outside rails flexing and not these so once we tie them together with some angle it'll kind of help stiffen everything up So we got all our seams welded up now. The thing is full welded. Now it's time to bust out the grinder and uh, try and pretty up some of the welds. Ow. Found a couple? Yeah. and that will make the rear oh dude so I don't even have to screw around with the front too much just make it sit low that's like perfect that's okay though what do you think I like it I think it's better to have it a tiny bit wider than the back yeah I like it all right, so what I did is I pressed, so we got a set of four wheel spacers. Turns out we can actually get the proper amount of offset that we want for the front just by flipping it uh, because they weren't zero offset wheels, which is cool. 
The rear is zero offset wheels, so we still needed the two inch wheel spacers in the back. So what I did is I just pressed the studs out of the other two wheel spacers that we weren't gonna use, bored these out, the holes out in the spindles, and then turned the press fit area down. So I got about a 2000s press fit. Pressed all the studs into the spindles, and then I machined our hub pilot uh, pilot board to match the pilot that's on these spindles, and voila. So now we can put the spindles on, torque them down, and then torque our wheel spacers down, and then we still have to uh, drill out the openings in the wheels because it has to fit these M12, I think they're M12 studs. Uh, and then we can put the rear wheels on and see how wide it is. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, I'd like to get it more up and down so that it's it's stiffer. All right, so the car is finally sitting on the ground on its own weight with its own suspension. Now the suspension is just kind of tacked together. I do that off camera because it's a lot of grinding and prepping and I think we have enough footage of me using a flapper wheel and a cutoff saw. So, got it tacked in. Front suspension is basically exactly the same as what the stock stuff was. Just obviously this cut and moved, the point for the shock mount cut and moved and brought up so that this thing sits lower and so the control arms are almost flat, which is perfect. The back. A little bit of special stuff going on here. So in the rear, I wanted to kind of design this in a way that we could still get the motor out from the back. So this whole shock mount is um, removable. So that you can take the shock off, take the shock mount off, and the motor can still come straight back out. Uh, and I know that the engine case isn't really like a load bearing component when it's in the stock form, but this is sort of at an angle where, you know, any load that's placed up against the shock it's not going to really have that much load going out this way uh, so I think it should be fine we'll see how it acts <laughs> this may work great or we may have to play around with the front spring rate a little bit to get to do what we want to do so but for now it's sitting on the ground and we need to finish welding this stuff up playing around with the handlebar position here and this seems to be a pretty good spot for it to land and still clear our knees when our feet are right here on the pedals uh, and still have enough reach to kind of get the full travel. Uh, one of the reasons why we decided to keep the handlebars instead of going with the steering wheel is because the ratio for the tie rod ends and everything out on the spindles uh, kind of requires that we have something that's nice and wide where the user has lots of leverage because if we switch to a steering wheel that's, you know, this big, uh, it'd be really hard to turn the wheels. So we're gonna keep the handlebars and because it looks kind of cool and uh, obviously it gives the off the impression that this used to be a four-wheeler. So going along with the theme of this project, trying to be as cheap uh, as possible and utilizing as much of what I cut off to make a stuff work I think I'm going to take, this was the like the original portion that was up here that held the, the handlebars or the mount for the steering column. I'm just going to trim this off and then I think use these because that's what the front bumper used to be mounted to. Uh, and mount it somewhere here, like so.
Oh, that's perfect. Dude. You got plenty of leverage there. <laughs> Machine some sleeves, that'll pivot, and then we weld the bigger nuts to the frame, and then we can take the old foot pegs, and we can fabricate sort of a pedal off of that, and then have a bar, you know, some flat bar that comes up here, and then the flat bar can also be where we uh, tie the um, cable to. All right, so we have our completed foot pedals here, which are pretty sweet looking. Um, and then all we gotta do is take these nuts and weld them to whatever as our pivot point. I think what I wanna do is take a piece of one inch flat bar and actually weld the pedals to the flat bar because then it makes it a little bit easier to position it on the chassis. And then it, you know, we can probably get them closer together too, so that they're not so far apart. Um, so we'll do that. And I got our shifter and e-brake lever made out of some Pittsburgh <laughs> wrenches that whatever steel these wrenches are made out of welds really nicely. So uh, it looks good. But those will kind of be like that together and they'll be kind of clocked so that your hands don't run into them. Um, and then this one's gonna, the shorter one's gonna be tied to the shifter, and then the longer one's gonna be tied to the master cylinder. So now, once these things are cooled, because they're really freaking hot, I need to drill holes in each of these to match the pivot points that I want um, for both the shifter location and for the, the handbrake. And luckily, cool thing about this, is this one for the shifter is actually pretty much the same length as the original shifter. And I cut the original shifter down so that we can attach the, the push-pull cable to it. So as long as I get my pivot point in roughly the same location, the ratio will be the same for the shifter. And for this guy, if you see here, this is the original rear brake. It's about the same length. So as long as I get the hole that I'm connected to, obviously this pivoted a different way, but leverage kind of works the same way. As long as I get this hole basically in the same spot as where the original master cylinder mounted, it should work out pretty good. Nice. <laughs> neutral so because I flipped this this shifter over the shift pattern is inverted but I kind of had to do it this way because I couldn't really put the cable up above but I think it'll probably just take some getting used to but first second third fourth yeah yeah fourth and then third come on Second, first, that's first. Wait, that's reverse. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> it. Luckily the wiring is super simple. Really easy to do. I want to make sure we don't have anything falling and arcing and doing exciting things.
yeah. Oh no, we got a little curb rash. <laughs> this thing is, oh, it's just because it's like a perforated piece of steel just like rolled and shoved in there. Yeah. It's not even, yeah. I can't, I can't drive around with it like that. Cause no. it like, it's That's really loud. super loud. I can't believe this actually does anything, but it's really loud without it. <sighs> Way more steering angle. Like I almost, <laughs> I almost couldn't even turn it around in the cul-de-sac. What? Yeah. The steering angle is awful. But it, it handles really good. It, it It's funny because it actually took quite a bit of whipping it and throttle input to get the back to slide. But once it did, it was like super controllable. Like really controllable. Mm -hmm. It was awesome. It was a lot of fun. I just kind of like leaned into the seat, into the bolster, and kind of pushed my butt and wiggled it, and I could like, <laughs> kind of play with the throttle a bit. It's a blast, dude. The only thing that sucks is these front brakes are just so not good. So I think what we're gonna have to do, especially the, the main thing is I need to get this moved to the other side because I realize, obviously, it's dumb because I can't, like if I'm starting from a stop, and you're on a hill or something, you need to be able to hold the brake, and you can't hold the brake and shift at the same time. So I was like holding with my left hand and then shifting, but so we just got, and that's easy, you just move this over to the other side. But the rest, like the controls feel good, other than the throttle being a little bit sticky at the bottom. I don't know, maybe I think I just need to pull that cable out and um, maybe put some lithium grease on it and get it to slide a little bit better because these are just cheap cables that I got on Amazon. So what you're looking at here is a 6,000 PSI rated uh, hydraulic hose for our brake line because I have a bunch of braided Teflon hose and crimp fittings but nobody in the area wants to crimp it for me nor does anybody else have the correct fittings or the correct dies to crimp it. So um, I went with a JIC hose. Probably a little bit overkill, but I just want to slide. That's all I want to do is slide. So we're going for it. <laughs> yeah, I think it works. Well, should we go test it now? Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> So, as I mentioned at the beginning of the video, this whole project didn't exactly end the way we were planning on it. Basically, long story short, some career changes and life just got, got in the way and the Go Quad ended up sitting here in the garage for a long time, not making any progress. So, we decided to sell it. And I wasn't planning on making a full build video like this because we had no real good conclusion. But enough people got really excited when I threw together that little YouTube short and put it on Instagram and everything that I decided, well, enough people were asking for a full video. Let's put it out here. So there it was. I did have several people commenting, asking if they could buy it from us. Obviously we sold it, so we can't sell it. However, I was doom scrolling Facebook Marketplace a couple months ago and guess what should pop up? So there it is. The GoQuad is available for sale on Marketplace. 
they're asking quite a bit more money than we sold it for, which is fine, cool, I hope they get it. Um, they also claim that it's a Yamaha, which it's not. And they also claim that it's a 450cc, which it's a 200. But you know what? Who knows? I don't know how many times this thing maybe changed hands and stories changed, but you know, you saw it here. That's what it is. Um, but there you go. It's available if you really, really want it. So that's really it for this Go Quad build. It was really fun, and maybe it inspired you guys to build something crazy like this on your own. There will be more projects and builds and features to come. So until then, I will see you guys on the next one.